nice to see you. Uh, my name is Colin, and I'm one of the members uh, of the church here. As we start our service, we're going to begin to do so by recognizing that uh, God is here. He is with us. He hears us, and he speaks to us. So we'll begin by speaking to him with a simple prayer. Let's pray. We know that you are the God of the universe, and yet you are here with us now. You're not a distant God outside of the realms of the universe, but you are here because you care about us. You created us, you made us into the people that we are, and you care deeply about our lives, and we thank you for that. This morning we come together in order to recognize that you are not just God, but our God. The one that we want to serve and the one that we worship. May our worship this morning please your heart. Amen. In Psalm 95 it says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. I want to encourage you to stand as we sing together.
just praise and we thank you this morning we can come in this place and we can declare that you are the reason we sing you are the reason we come together and we praise and we thank you for that this morning ago, my wife and I discovered what we think is one of the most special places in Swindon. It's called the Walled Garden, and it's in Lydiard Park. We call it the Secret Garden. If you've seen the film The Secret Garden or read the book, then you know what I'm talking about. It's about a garden, a walled garden, that two children found, and it's almost a magical place. So we call the walled garden in Lydia Park the secret garden. Because when you're in there, well, each time we've been there, there's been nobody else at all. And no one can see in from outside. And you know what? It is the perfect place for a picnic. Anyone like picnics? Yeah, oh, quite some enthusiastic hands going up there. Now, tell me, what sort of things do you eat when you go for a picnic? Do you have strewed cabbage? Frog's legs? Snails? No? What do you have? Go on. Sandwiches. Sandwiches. What of? Marmite? Ham? Okay, half the congregation said, ugh, at Marmite, and half we'd be thinking, oh, great. Well, I'm amongst those that think it's great. Can any of you think of a picnic that Jesus took part in? Over there. Shout out loud. Absolutely well done. Ten marks out of ten for you. When he fed... The 5,000. None of the adults answered that, you notice. So they obviously don't know the story. 
So, well, one adult <laughs> remembered. So, kids, in order to remind the adults what happened, let's see a very short video about it, okay? Stories of the Bible. Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He did many miracles and healed people of their sickness. Oh, hey, everyone. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. The crowd started to gather around Jesus. There were 5,000 men and many more women and children. Turning to Philip, he asked, Hey, Philip! Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? You see, Jesus was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Um. Philip replied, Even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Hey, I got an idea. Then Andrew spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Jesus said, tell everyone to sit down. Back, everyone, sit down. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and gave them to the people. There you go. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Want some more? I'm all good, thanks. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. You got it. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves and two fish. When that happened, apart from Jesus, who was the next most important person in that account, do you think? Yeah, go on, tell me. No? No? Yeah? Shout out loud. The boy, another 10 marks out of 10. Very, very good. The boy was. Why? Because without him, no one would have had anything to eat, would they? So apart from Jesus, the next most important person in that account is the little boy. When they were looking for food to see what was there that they could eat, it wasn't that the boy hid it, thinking, you know, I'm hungry, this is my lunch. I'm not going to give that to Jesus. No, he gave everything that he had to Jesus, didn't he? All of his lunch he gave uh, to Jesus. And when Jesus took it and fed 5,000 plus people with it, don't you think he was a little bit surprised? I, didn't, I don't think mum had given me that much food. No, it was what Jesus did. Yes? I heard as far as, I don't think that. Jesus wasn't surprised that he was the one who gave him the food. Yeah, neither am I. The boy gave everything that he had to Jesus. And I'm not surprised it was a boy because Jesus loves it when children give everything they have to him. When I was a boy, I asked Jesus to come into my life and I gave him my life. I didn't have much else to give him. I didn't have any fish sandwiches. Uh, but I gave him my life. And you know, just as what Jesus did with that boy's sandwiches, Jesus done with my life. 
and wants to do with your life as well. No one is too young to give their life to Jesus. No one is too young that Jesus doesn't love it when they do. So don't forget that, huh? No one is too young to be important to Jesus. We're going to take up uh, the offering now. Uh, stewards will come around with that. If you're visiting us, please don't be embarrassed. Just let the bag go past. Lots of people give by standing order and in other ways so that they will let the bag go past uh, as well. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, everything that we have comes from you because you created it all in the first place. And so in giving this that we give to your church, we are really giving back to you what you've already given to us. As a way of saying thank you, Lord, for all that you have given to us. Would you take this money and all the money that comes in from standing orders and would you use it in your service and help those who make the decisions about it to be wise in the way in which it is spent? Amen. Amen. David has a notice for us. people are struggling can you hear me now on Sunday the 5th of June uh, it's it's Pentecost uh, and also it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee um, on that day 5th of June there will be no morning service here in church uh, instead there'll be an 11 a.m. service uh, over on Edinburgh Street Rec which is the, the big field um, behind uh, Gorse Hill Primary School after we've had our morning service, uh, we'll all bring a picnic, hopefully, uh, with wh whatever you want in your picnic. Um, and we'll also be serving tea uh, and coffee and some scones as well. I loved Philip's face on that video. I think that was the same face that Christine pulled when Johnny told her how many scones we were going to buy. <laughs> like that. Um, you, need to, you need to bring your own picnic. Uh, we'd also like you to bring your own chair. Uh, or a blanket to sit on. So yeah, we'll have a service together. Uh, then there'll be a time of, uh, of sharing food. And we've got a few other things going on as well. And brilliantly, uh, some of the other churches in Gorse Hill are joining us for that. That's going to be awesome. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet just outside the doors here. Uh, we do need a little bit of help with serving tea and coffee. Um, after we've had lunch as well, we're going to have a craft tent and a prayer tent. Uh, we'd love some people uh, to be in there for about an hour. Uh, and the whole thing will close at two o'clock uh, when we'll gather again uh, for a short service. But 11 a.m., uh, the morning service will start over on the wreck. Uh, and bring your own chair, bring your own blanket, and please bring your own uh, food and drink as well uh, to enjoy afterwards. Thank you. 
Uh, in just a moment, the young people and children are going to be going out to their groups. If you are visiting and you have children and uh, are not sure where to take them, then please just follow the crowd and someone will lead you to the right place. But if the young people and children would like to go now with their leaders... over to you. We're going to share together in a few songs. So uh, again, encourage you to stand, but feel free to stand or sit as, uh, as works for you uh, as we praise together.
if any of you want to check out the uh, walled garden, as I said, it's in Lydiard Park. It's next to the conference centre, and it costs a pound. But don't too many of you go, huh? because we like being on our own there. <laughs> if I were to ask you to choose two words that represent everything that we need to eat and drink in order to survive, what would that be? That is a question. Come on, think back, especially older people. Yes. Water and bread. Bread and water. Of course, the reality of our lives is a little bit broader than that, isn't it? The typical shopping uh, basket that the government uses in order to uh, calculate inflation includes not only bread and water, but all sorts of uh, food stuff, heating, fuel, clothing, the basic sort of stuff. But these days, it also includes 40-inch televisions, microwaves, computer games, lip gloss, smartphones, and even, even dating agency fees. These are the sorts of things that the government thinks are necessary for our survival, and they work out inflation on the basis of that sort of thing. But if you want to know in even more detail, then you need to look at the things that bailiffs are not allowed to take away from your house when you are in bad debt. And that includes not only food, bedding, cooking equipment, but also toys, fridge, freezer, television, car, tools, and so on. And I guess that most of us will actually be in agreement that these are basic uh, for our survival in society today. And as a result, most of our lives are spent in working to ensure that we can obtain those sorts of things for our survival. Surprisingly enough, the two words that we would use to represent everything that we need, bread and water, today, is exactly the same as would have been said at the time of Jesus. But with very much more reason than we say it today. What bread and water would have represented wouldn't have included, of course, televisions and smartphones, although there would have been matchmakers, so maybe some dating agency fees. Their shopping basket would not have included things like fennel and celeriac and coffee and mangoes and rump steak, not even potatoes. For the normal working person, there was no such thing as breakfast. If you were fortunate, you might be able to take a crust of bread with you when you went and eat it as you went to work. But generally speaking, you worked on an empty stomach. Lunch would have been a snack, and it would have been a piece of bread, and maybe you had some olive oil to dip it in, or, if you had a shepherd in the family, you might have a bit of sheep's or goat's cheese. Or if you had a fisherman in the family, then you might have a bit of dried uh, fish. But mostly, it was bread. When it came to the evening meal, which is the main meal of the day, it wasn't very much. Mostly, it would have been some form of vegetarian stew, because meat was so very expensive and few people could afford it. Uh, as many of you know, we lived in Argentina for 14 years, and uh, Argentines are the biggest meat eaters in the world. They certainly used to be the world's largest uh, exporter uh, of, of beef. And after living there for 14 years, I would have to admit that for me, a meal is not a meal unless it includes meat. I remember one time being uh, in a, a group where we were all asked the question, what couldn't you live without? And the answers were things like, God, uh, my wife, mine was meat. <laughs> if I were Japanese, it would probably have been rice. Uh, one of my sons-in-laws is uh, Norwegian, and for Norwegians, a meal is not a meal unless it includes potatoes. But for the first century Jew, the answer would have been bread. That was the main thing in all of their meals. 
Stop and think for a moment. You've heard of the Lord's Prayer? That's the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. He says, give us our daily bread. Yeah? For the first century Jew, uh, the most staple, the most basic requirement to supporting life was bread. I'm going to stop for a moment and uh, Alison is going to lead us in some prayers of intercession. Thank you, Alison. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your provision for us. We thank you for this wonderful world that you've created for us with all its beauty. But Father, there are lots of people within the world who are finding life very difficult at the moment. And we pray that you would be with our world leaders to act wisely, to help all the different tricky situations around the world. We ask, ask your wisdom for parents who are protecting their families, parents who have to decide whether to stay or whether to leave, parents deciding whether to eat or whether to have the heating on. We pray for church leaders and for charities and for volunteers as they strive to support and comfort people in various situations. We ask for wisdom and compassion from our global leaders, leaders who have the power not just to start wars but also to stop them. Father, we pray for your peace and your protection on those who are in danger, those who are experiencing fear, and for those who are grieving. We ask you to help our leaders in this time of economic instability. We know that you are the creator of all things and you are the provider of everything we possess, and yet so often we make bad decisions and this affects each other. Help our governments to find solutions to increasing poverty in our nation. We pray for our own church. We pray for the people within church who are finding life difficult. And we pray for those who are working week in and week out to try and help not just people here, but people around Gorse Hill and the surrounding area. We pray for Luncheon Club. We pray for Bags of Hope. We pray for the community fridge and we thank you that we've been able to reach out to lots and lots of people. Be with those people who provide this service. Be with these people who meet week after week with people who are finding life very difficult. We also pray for those who are still suffering from the effect of COVID, for those who have lost confidence, those who are finding it difficult to venture out and also for those suffering with long COVID. Father, reach out to them. Let them know that your hands of love are amongst them. We pray for John Webb, who's finding life hard with his health challenges, and also for his friend Trevor and for Alison. Father, be with them and be with other people that we know who are having health difficulties at the moment. We pray for Becky and Ryan and for others within this church who have recently lost people. Father, be with them. May they know the warmth of your love. And finally, Father, we look at our children and our teenagers who at the moment are starting their exams. Father, I pray for each member of our church who are taking GCSEs and A-levels and degrees and so on within the church. Father. Help them to stay calm, help them to stay focused, help them to do their best. And finally, Father, as we move into a time where we haven't got a minister, we pray for Steve and Christine, that you'll be with them, that you'll guide them, that you'll refresh them. And we pray for Martin Cook, who's going to come alongside us as we plan our future. Father, we ask all these things. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Alison. 
a few years ago, uh, I spoke here about King Solomon and the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, I want to briefly just mention again some of the things I said on that occasion because the book of Ecclesiastes is one of the most important and yet misunderstood books uh, in the Bible. Solomon, King Solomon was the one who wrote it. And I'm guessing that everyone here will have heard of King Solomon, even if it's just because of books and films that have been made about the lost diamond mines of Solomon uh, and so on. The Bible tells us that Solomon was the wisest person that ever lived. It says, Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. And history tells us as well that he has always been famous for his wisdom. So famous that even today, when you're referring to somebody who said something very wise, they've got the wisdom of Solomon. It's as if he's the highest standard of wisdom and everybody else is measured uh, against uh, his wisdom. And he speaks an enormous amount about being wise and wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, the words occur 48 times uh, in the book. Early on in his reign as king, he used his wisdom to organize build and develop the small nation of uh, Israel into one of the largest empires in that part of the world. And it was so full of wealth and power that people, kings and queens, travelled from distant countries in order to visit it, to see the splendour and the beauty of Jerusalem and the temple and the land as a whole and to meet King Solomon. Amongst those, of course, was the famous Queen of Sheba. But even though Solomon was wise, even though he was the, most power, the, the, the leader of the most powerful country in that part of the world, he wasn't satisfied. The power, fame and riches he had attained weren't enough. So he begins to search for something else that will truly satisfy his soul. Something that will give him the secret to self-satisfaction and inner fulfillment. Because he was so wealthy, he had a, a, a superabundance of everything that he needed in order to be able to do a no-holds-barred search for inner fulfillment. He had unlimited time. The country was so well organized that all of the authorities, governors and so on, were running the country for him. Solomon had more money uh, than Elon Musk, who has about $290 billion at the present time. He had power, troops, counselors, contractors, artisans, academics, and so on, all at his disposal. So he begins his search, and the first thing he does is to turn to philosophy. He researches the great philosophical writers of his day. He meditates on their theories. He studies all of the prevailing explanations that there were with respect to the origin, the meaning, and the purpose of life. And when he's read all of the textbooks and when he's researched as much as he possibly can and he's thought about all the different arguments that there were at that time about life, he focuses his brain power on all that he's read and studied and he writes in the Bible, then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. He's not saying that philosophy had no value, but he takes philosophy as far as it will go and he concludes that he's never going to find satisfaction, inner fulfillment in philosophy. So Solomon crosses philosophy off his list of research and he turns to pleasure-seeking. And he writes in Ecclesiastes that he drank only the best wines in the world and ate only the best foods. He built gardens and parks and ponds. He surrounded himself with beautiful buildings. He hired male and female singers and an orchestra that could play and sing at his demand. He had a harem of a thousand women and the list of things that he had and did in seeking pleasure goes on and on and on 
And at the end of that, he writes, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I'd told to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. So power didn't satisfy him. Money didn't satisfy him. Philosophy didn't satisfy him. And pleasure didn't satisfy him either. So next on his list were possessions. And he became an incredible materialist. First, he builds a mansion for himself. And we're not talking about a small palace. We're talking about a massive palace. It's so huge and so lavish that he forced thousands of Israelites to leave their homes and come and build his palace over a period of 13 years. And he used gold and silver and precious gems lavishly right throughout his palace. And it wasn't the only thing he built either. He built lots and lots of different things. He also acquired the largest herds of animals, planted the best forests and the best vineyards. He collected art and treasures from all over the world. Any item that caught his fancy, he would acquire. And he continued to do this until he wrote, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. And when he'd gone all the way down the road of acquiring everything that he possibly could uh, want to have, he focuses his minds on it all and concludes that it was all vanity, like chasing after the wind. This doesn't satisfy my soul either, he wrote. Power didn't, riches didn't, fame didn't, philosophy didn't, pleasure-seeking didn't, and possessions didn't. And so he continues to, to, to explore one avenue after another avenue after another avenue. And the first seven chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes are all about this search that he had for inner fulfillment. A desperate search. And you can bet that if the Rolling Stones happened to have been around at the time when he was doing all of this, then he would have been able to agree completely with, I can't get no satisfaction, but I try and I try and I try and I try. Then at the very end of Solomon's search, after years of trial and error experimentation, the smartest man in the world arrives at his final conclusion as to how to experience inner satisfaction. And he writes this. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And this applies to every single person, no exceptions at all. True inner fulfillment, satisfying the soul, only comes through fearing God and following the way in which he wants us to live. It's as if we had all had this God-shaped hole in our lives, but the only thing that can fill is God himself. Nothing else will satisfy it. Nothing else will fill it. And I wonder how many of us know without a doubt that true soul satisfaction can only be found in a vital relationship with God. We're going to stop for a moment and Paul is going to come and do a reading for us. Thank you, Paul. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me. <clears throat> not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures, to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. But on him, the, for him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. They then asked him, What must we do? What must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that they, we may see it believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna 
in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, <clears throat> given, given, given you the bread from the world. Sir they, sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here, in, here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone, must eat, anyone may eat and not die. I am, living, I am the living bread that came from, down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Thank you, Paul. The story that we saw together with the children was called The Feeding of the 5,000. That's not quite accurate, is it? Because the Bible says that there were 5,000 men who were present, plus a whole host of women and children. So realistically, we're talking about a crowd of around 20,000 people, not 5,000. All fed by a boy's lunch of five small loaves and two fish. This was such an amazing thing that no one there would have been debating with themselves whether a miracle had taken place or not. This was a definite God stepped in, created something out of next to nothing, and so much of it so that 20,000 people were more than satisfied because there were leftovers, and an awful lot of them. We've been thinking, this crowd of people were normally hungry because they didn't have much to eat. I've already mentioned what a normal person would have had to eat on a normal day. And that wasn't because they were on a permanent diet. The oppression of the Roman Empire and the exploitation of the Roman Empire was such that the people never had enough to eat. But now a miracle had happened. And probably for the first time in an awful long time, their stomachs were full and they were satisfied. It wasn't the first time something like this had happened. In the Bible reading that Paul did, it referred back to the time of Moses when God miraculously rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt and took them through the desert to the promised land, a land where he said they would have more than sufficient to eat and where they would be free because they would no longer be slaves. But he was taking them through a desert and there's no food in the desert. And so God worked a miracle in order to keep them from starvation. Every morning, six days a week, they would find on the ground a substance they called manna, from which they could make bread. And in Exodus it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Bread from heaven. For the people of Israel, manna came to represent God's salvation. The fact that God loved them so much that he didn't leave them without food. Instead, he provided everything that they needed in order to survive. And it came to symbolize for the people of Israel God's continuing presence and relationship with them as a people. So much so that they took some of the manna, they put it in a jar, and they put that into the Ark of the Covenant, which was the symbol of God's presence with the people. And now... Through Jesus, God has done it again. And you can imagine that the people were so continuously hungry that they were hoping that he would go on to do it every single day for them. They were so caught up with their hunger and their fight for survival that they couldn't see beyond the desire of having enough bread to eat every day. Under similar circumstances, wouldn't you? And many people in Britain and throughout the world today are living under those circumstances. Just think, if our lives were taken up, are taken up 
with working to provide what is necessary to support our families, and that would put in jeopardy what then would you do? What if I, uh, unemployment were to come along suddenly, or debilitating illness that meant that you couldn't work anymore and you had to live on benefits, where it's almost impossible to be able to survive? Wouldn't your greatest concern and all of your efforts be spent in pursuing any route that might lead to a ready provision for what you need in order to survive? That's the reason why, as a church, we have something called Stepping Stones, which is aimed at helping people that are struggling in our local community with primarily food. And thousands of people have already been helped by this. But it's called Stepping Stones and not something else for a reason. We've been thinking about the fact that what people really need goes beyond just food. Now, I would never want to minimise the importance of people's need to have what uh, people's need to have that which they need to survive. It's so important that we help them in this role. But we know there's greater need than the need of meeting our food for today. Solomon had already shown that when all our physical needs are met, it's not enough. We remain hungry for something else. It's as if there's this God-shaped hole in all of us that only God can fill. Nothing else can fill. But all too often we don't get it because all of our priorities are about satisfying our physical needs. And it was the same for the crowd of 20,000 odd people that were caught up uh, with Jesus on that day, the day after he had fed them all. And so the first thing Jesus says when he sees the crowd is, truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. It's not that he wasn't concerned about their physical needs, he fed them, didn't he? Of course he was concerned about them. But Jesus explains to them that they need much more than just having their hunger filled. You see, Jesus never saw life exclusively in the light of the years that we spend here on this earth. We do. Our main concern in life is providing for our families. Providing a roof over our heads, food on the table, clothing in the wardrobe, heat in the cold, and a pension for when we retire. But Jesus wanted people to see that it's so much more than that. And that's what he tried to explain to the people that met up with him the day after he'd fed that great big crowd. Honestly, life without food, excuse me, life without God is meaningless. You look at me, you look at my size and you think, well, he doesn't have any problems, does he? It's not always been like that. I remember days when we were very, very hungry, when we had one piece of fruit for a family of six a week. I remember what it was like. My wife remembers it even more than I did, when the only thing she could give to the children were bread with a little bit of sugar on it. They loved it, of course, but that's all we could afford. We know what that's like. We also know what it's like to have plenty, but it's not enough if God isn't there. The people didn't get it when Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, I'm the one that you need, not just the food. They didn't get it. So you're going to give us manna just as God did all those days, every day. Are we going to have full stomachs every day, just as in the days of Moses? Is that what you're saying? A miracle that's going to supply everything that we need in life. The winning lottery ticket. So we'll never have to worry again about paying a mortgage or anything like that. Never have to work again. Always have money to spend. And Jesus says to us, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. It's all about me, about believing in me, about giving your life to me. 
And at long last, the people understood. The result? I'll come to that in a minute. Jesus was saying to them, look, I'm here now. God has sent me. I'm the manna from heaven. God has sent me. He was all that they needed in order to have the sort of relationship the Israelites thought they had with God in the desert when God loved them and provided them with everything that they needed. But it meant it was crunch time for the people. A decision had to be made to accept that he truly was manna from heaven, got sent by God, and that if they trusted in him, if they asked him into their lives, they would enter into a unique relationship with God or they could reject him and the Bible tells us that even many of his disciples turned around and walked away because they weren't ready to ask God into their lives God does care about our immediate physical needs that's why he tells us to take our needs to him in prayer isn't it so that he can step in and he can change things. God does care about our immediate physical needs. But God, God cares even more about our need to have him involved in our lives. Here and now, and our eternal needs. And so do we as a church. We understand that about the people who live around us, which is why we have stepping stones in the first place. God cares about the people and their physical needs that are around us, but he also cares about their eternal needs, their need for a relationship with him. And that's what we want to see, people coming to know Jesus. When I was a teenager, I wasn't any good at football or rugby, but I was good at high jump. And from a very young age, I'd always been able to jump higher than I, could, uh, than I was tall. And when I was in secondary school, I was determined that I would reach uh, national uh, competition. And so I trained every day, and I worked very hard at it every day. Uh, and eventually, I actually managed to represent the county in national trials. Uh, but I left that goal for my life a long time ago because there were other goals that were more attractive to me. For a lot of people, or for a certain number of people, their ultimate goal is indeed to become an Olympic uh, champion. But when they achieve that, life moves on. And then there's the next goal, whatever that might be. Whether that's the right job, the right house, the right husband, the right wife, the right car, whatever it is. And so we develop this pattern in our lives of going from one goal to another goal to another goal to another goal. And every time we achieve one, we move on to the next one, searching for something, searching to have that whole field that is in our lives that only God can fill at the end of the day. Remember what Solomon said, he had it all. And it wasn't enough. You know, the crowd that were talking with Jesus, they believed in the existence of God. Of course they did. They were Jews. The whole of their culture was based on their belief in the existence of God. But giving their lives to him, asking him to come and be their personal God who controlled everything that was going on in their lives, that's, that's something else, isn't it? At that time, they had it easy because the manna from heaven was standing there in front of them. Jesus was there. They had seen what he could do and they were listening to him as he spoke to them. He'd shown his divinity by working that miracle and many other miracles as well. But they stopped at the point of going further than that. Many rejected him and turned and walked away. We're offered exactly the same choice today. If you, like many people, believe in the existence of God, that's great, but it's not enough. 
If you're amongst those that believe that Jesus is God, that's great, but it's not enough. Because if you've never acted on that belief, if you've never said, God, I give my life to you, come into my life, forgive me of what I've done wrong, enter my life, be my God, then that hole is never, ever going to be filled. Or maybe you've done that in the past, but then you would have to admit that you've neglected your relationship with God. And as a result, that sense of knowing that you are really alive because God is in your life has gone. I just want to say quite simply this morning, now you can do something about it. Let's pray. Father, we began this morning by saying that you are here with us. You are God here. You stand before us and in all your majesty and your power, you wait for us to say, God, come into my life. Quite simply, if you would want to change that, then there is a simple prayer you can say. And I'll just say it, and you can say it in your own heart and mind. Dear God, will you forgive me for all that I have done wrong in my life? And will you come into my life and fill my soul with your presence? That I might live every day of my life with you. Or maybe what you need to say is, Lord, forgive me that I have not kept you as God in my life, but have neglected you, have neglected my relationship with you. Would you please, please forgive me? I want to turn to you this morning and give you my life again. Would you take it? And would you enter my life every day? Amen. If you prayed one of those prayers this morning, please would you talk to somebody about it? It doesn't have to be me. It can be someone that you can confide in and just tell them what has taken place this morning because that's an important thing to do. Okay. Before we sing, just a reminder and to encourage if you're able to join us this evening, we have the opportunity to meet in here again at 6.30. And if you have just um, prayed that prayer today or you prayed it many years ago, just the, the final song that we'll share together is a real reminder of the God that we pray to is a God we can trust and a God that just never, never leaves us alone. Let's stand together and sing.
let's just bow our heads in prayer. May God fill your heart, fill your life with his presence. May you know that he is with you every moment of every day. May the Holy Spirit guide you and lead you and help you to live as God wants you to. Amen. Thank you all.